Let's give our confession of faith. Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Amen. Let's greet each other. Let us receive the guidance of God's word. Today's message is entitled, One Who Only Does the Will of God. Nowadays, autumn leaves are falling, and autumn leaves mean that leaves lose their green color and change to yellow or red colors as a natural phenomenon. Some people see the leaves that turn red and admire their beautiful appearance. However, there is another meaning to this. The leaves turning red means that the trees are preparing for winter. It means that they are in the process of preparing for winter. When the amount of sunlight decreases and the temperature drops, the activity of other pigments in the leaves become more active than chlorophyll, which was active during summer. Therefore, if the leaves have a lot of keratins, they turn red. And if the leaves have a lot of xanthophyll, they turn yellow, like ginkgo leaves. And when a separation layer forms at the tip of the leaves, the nutrient pathway is cut off. And at this time, the color of the autumn leaves become more vivid. Then the leaves fall. Only the minimal things are left to prepare for winter. And the rest all falls. In cold winters, water is almost not supplied to the end of the branches to prevent them from freezing. This shows how thoroughly trees prepare according to the seasons. What this signifies is that our lives should be this way spiritually. When various problems and crises arise, we are bound to fall if we are not spiritually prepared. And that is why we must be spiritually always prepared. When problems arise, we might just fall to it. This was the case for the Israelites because they were not spiritually prepared. When problems and crises happened, and when they continuously came to them, and because they were not spiritually prepared, they all fell. And in the end, what happened? They became enslaved. They become enslaved and taken as captives and colonized and wandered around the world. We must not live a life that receives spiritually help from others, but we must be at a spiritual level to care and to protect others. And that's the title of today's word says, what is important for this is to know what God's will is and to act according to that will. Do not use this and that method, but whenever problems come, think about what is God's method or God's will within that. May you properly remember that. The walk of faith is not something else, but it's realizing where God's will is and carrying out that will. My calculations, my assertions and fixed ideas, if you follow that, you will not be led. The Apostle John clearly states in the last verse of today's passage that the world and its desires pass away, but whoever does the will of God abides forever. They will abide forever. God's will is of many things. God's will may be a variety of things. However, 
what is it that we're most familiar with? It is from 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 to 18. It says, rejoice always. It's such a difficult thing to do, right? Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. Give thanks in all circumstances. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. That is what the will of God is, to rejoice always. And so, oh, I have more sadness than things to be happy about. That's true. But even then, because of this is the word, rejoice always. Some people say, Pastor, you're too scary. You know, my heart is not that way, but I think perhaps my facial expression is that way. So they say, can you try and smile? And so I smile. It's also the same thing for you. And so to rejoice always, put on a smile always. Sometimes you don't want to pray, right? We, most of us, don't pray. Pray without ceasing, it says. And even if problems were to come, do not be put forth your scars, your pain, your resentment and complaints, but instead give thanks. This is God's will, it says. the method Jesus came to us why did Jesus come to us? because it was God's will John 6.38 says for I have come down from heaven not to do my will but to do the will of him who sent me even Jesus when he came to earth in the flesh, it means that he also underwent extreme difficulties. And to bear the cross is a very extremely difficult thing, but to bear the cross was the will of God. And he needed to also suffer pain. What is God's will manifested through Jesus Christ? It is the crucifixion and resurrection. That was God's will and God's schedule. It was God's fulfillment of His prophecy. And that is why there is an existence of God, because all that was prophesied were accurately fulfilled. What God, what other God has prophesied and has perfectly fulfilled the prophecies. But when it comes to prophecies, it needs to be accurately fulfilled. But when it is that easy for all of that to be accurately fulfilled no matter how much time has passed and the old testament prophesies all about jesus and the old and the new testament fulfills all of that and that is why it proves and supports the existence of god And that is why the only way for salvation of human beings, the only path to free from all sins, curses, and the power of death is the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus Christ. That was the method by which God saved us. And while we were still sinners, Jesus died on the cross and he demonstrated his love for us. What is God's love? It is the crucifixion and resurrection. In particular, Jesus fully carried out God's will on this earth and proclaimed God's will for us. And as he proclaimed God's will for us, he ascended. And that is seen in Mark 28, 18 to 20, Matthew 16, 15 to 20, John 21, 15 to 17, and Acts 1, 8. To all nations, to all people, to the next generation, to the end of the earth. That's what he said, and he ascended. That was his last command. That was his last words. In other words, it tells us to become the absolute disciples of Jesus Christ and to be the main figures in the evangelization of regions, nations, and the world. 
To achieve this, our church is currently expanding the place of our church, our region, the two three seven nations, and our flesh and bone. Because this is God's will, may you do the will of God and leave behind an eternal masterpiece and live a life that is considered of the highest value before God. Point number one, a life of growth. Verse 12 says, I am writing to you, little children, because your sins are forgiven for his name's sake. I am writing to you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. I am writing to you, young men, because you have overcome the evil one. I write to you, children, because you know the Father. I write to you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. I write to you, young men, because you're strong and the word of God abides in you and you have overcome the evil one. In these verses, the Apostle John explains the spiritual stages of believers by comparing them to stages of physical age. This is pertaining to the spiritual age. He emphasizes that believers who are reconciled with God and enjoy spiritual fellowship through Christ's mediating work should not remain stagnant, should not remain there, but instead in every aspect of life, every day, they must mature and grow in their faith. That is the normal spiritual life. John begins by clarifying the foundation of faith. To grow spiritually, one must first be born again, he says. What does John call this? He re recalls this and refers to this as the forgiveness of sins. Spiritual growth begins from the moment one receives forgiveness through Jesus Christ. Why do we believe in Jesus Christ? Because we are sinners to receive the forgiveness of our sins, to be resolved of our sin problems. And after that, we live as ones who have assurance of the forgiveness of our sins. And that's when our walk of faith begins. Apostle John addresses three different groups within the church, illustrating how they're called to live based on their level of spiritual maturity. Now that we have received salvation, now that we have received the forgiveness of our sins, Apostle John suggests how we must live our lives. The first group he addresses is the children. Children. Individuals who are still children spiritually. In Greek, the word paideia means inexperienced people. So this is pertaining to those who lack spiritual experience. This refers to those new in their faith, knowing who know God and who have received forgiveness of sins, but are still in an early stage of spiritual understanding. They are called children. No matter how old you may be, they are spiritual children because children do not really understand very well. They are very stubborn and their thoughts are everything to them. And so it, we're talking about an early stage of spiritual growth. They are at an early stage of faith. And the second group is the young men. In verse 13, it says, young men have overcome the evil one. And the evil one refers to Satan, one who destroys a church, who destroys the believers, who lead us to temptation. A characteristic of young adults is strength and passion. They face any challenge with confidence, energy, and enthusiasm. Yet in verse 14, John explains that the strength of these young believers, of young adults, is not merely a physical passion, but a spiritual power rooted in the Word of God. It is a spiritual passion. They are called spiritually, spiritual young adults. They do their best and what is entrusted to them, and they ex exert spiritual influence, and they create spiritual dynamics. That is what a spiritual young adult is. They, they are spiritual young men or spiritual young adults who receive guidance from the Word and apply practically, achieving victory in spiritual battles. 
ones who have stood confidently after overcoming all spiritual battles are the spiritual young adults and lastly john addresses the fathers in verses 13 and 14 he mentions that the fathers know him who's from the beginning this is repeated twice here the word to know is not talking about intellectual knowledge but it pertains to a deep experiential understanding it means that they have experienced the word being fulfilled, the, their, ans their prayers being answered. In other words, these believers have matured through various spiritual experiences, so their faith remains unshaken regardless of the circumstances. May all our Yeon believers get to this stage. They are not shaken. In other words, through a deep fellowship with God, they are at a state of enjoyment. No matter what problems come, they're just enjoying it and that is when they have ha they have the gospel become their nature because if not it will be difficult to enjoy but because they have a gospel nature they simply enjoy john emphasizes that every believer should grow beyond the initial stage of childlike faith toward greater maturity may you continuously grow there is a story about the famous medieval theologian anselm who saw children tying a bird he saw that children were trying to tie a bird to a stone with a string while traveling with his disciples and you know imagine how heavy a bird a uh, heavy a stone might be for a bird the bird tries to fly away but it was pulled back down and Anselm remarked at that time to his disciples, that bird reminds me of our souls. If only we could cut the string binding us to sin, we too could soar freely. Even our soul, if we were to cut this, the string that binds us, we could simply soar freely. If there are still things holding you back from spiritual growth, then may you cut them off today. Because if you cut them off, then you'll be able to enjoy that growth. George Mueller once said, the vitality of our walk of faith depends on the proportion of the word of God in our lives and thoughts. One who has the word in them, they have the strength to overcome the problems. However, those who do not have the word, they have built their house upon sand, so they are shaken and they crumble depending on what others might say. And so the houses that they built for the past 20, 30 years was built upon a sand, and so they crumble, but the house that is built upon the rock will never crumble. The secret to spiritual growth and enjoyment is not about effort, but it is about holding on to God's word. You must receive grace from the word of God. You must be moved by it. You must be shocked by it. All the things that have shackled your ankles and that cannot that is hindering you from spiritual growth, may you all completely discard and cut those things off. There is a de desert plant called mesquite. It has extensive roots that can reach as deep as 50 meters below the desert sand to draw water. And because it is able to extend its roots so deep and draw water, is able to survive even under that hot, hot sun all day. But in the end, no matter how beautiful a plant appears, 
its roots cannot withstand the sun or even a slight breeze if its roots are weak. Likewise, by deeply rooting ourselves in the Word of God, we can grow and stand firm through the world's trials, storms, continuously changing environments, circumstances, and temptations. May the Word of God take up, up the greatest proportion in your life and may you taste spiritual growth each day. And point number two, it's a life of discernment. Verse 15 says, Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. The Apostle John teaches that those who follow God's will need discernment to know what to love and avoid. And he specifically warns against loving the world. Here, the world does not refer to the world in the sense of John 3, 16, where it is written, For God so loved the world. That meant that God loved the souls in the world. But the world here, it refers to the world the world, the evil world, the evil system under Satan's influence and power. John gives two reasons why we should not love the world. First, love for the world and love for God cannot coexist. Because when it comes to the spiritual realm, there is a principle, and that is that you cannot love the world and love God simultaneously it has a fundamental principle in faith just as light and dark cannot coexist when light enters darkness flees so we must choose one and second as stated in verse 17 everything in the world is temporary and will pass away while what is in god is eternal and that's what when you give your life and your materials before God, those devotions that you give, th those are eternal devotions. And so the other things that you may do physically and materialistically, those are temporary. But the ones that you do before God with a mindset of Koram Deo, standing before God, that is eternal. So whether it is your devotion, your offering, whether you speak, whatever you do, May you invest in what is eternal. Oh, to what you will leave behind eternally. John summarizes worldly desires into three categories in verse 16. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. These is not from the Father, but is from the world. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, th these are the three primary tools Satan uses to tempt and deceive. The lust of the flesh refers to the physical desires that oppose God. The lust of the eyes involves greed aroused by what one sees. And the pride of life is the arrogance of boasting about temporary and materialistic things. They say, people say, oh, you know, back then, back in those days. So ones that highlight the physical things of their life, the ones that leave one to become arrogant. In Genesis 3, Satan used these three strategies to attempt Adam and Eve, leading to their fall. The fruit of the tree was, it said, good for food. It's the lust of the flesh, a delight to the eyes, the lust of the eyes, and desirable to make one wise. That's pride of life. This led to the tragic fall of humanity. And Satan used the same tactics to tempt Jesus in Matthew 4. 
when he fasted, when Jesus fasted for 40 days. So if you look at Matthew 4, Satan comes to Jesus, who had been fasting for 40 days, and asks Jesus, aren't you hungry? So you see these stones, you have power, so why don't you make bread from stones? And so Satan was trying to tempt Jesus with the desires of the flesh. Then Jesus was brought up to the top of a mountain, and the devil showed him the heavens and the earth and their glory and offered Jesus all these things if he would worship him. That was the lust of the eyes. Then it was a temptation. The devil tried to tempt Jesus to jump from the pinnacle of the temple so that he could prove that he is the son of God, and that is the pride of life. But how did Jesus resist all of Satan's temptation? Was it with his character? No, it was with the word of God. Through Deuteronomy, he overcame all of Satan's deceptions. And all of his temptations completely crumbled because Jesus also completely solved all these problems on the cross and gave us eternal life, true life, through his resurrection and ascension. The failure of the first Adam was completely restored by the second Adam, Jesus Christ. Ones who live a walk of faith on earth, although because we have physical bodies, we may have physical problems, but because you are created in God's image, may you be restored to that. And that is why we are able, because we are created in God's image, we're able to call God our Father. That's how we have been restored. Adam and Eve called God Father. That has been restored in us. And to what it, does it mean to enjoy this grace of restoration? That is to walk and live a walk of faith. When filled with the joy of faith in Jesus, we may, we, we, uh, when we are not filled with the faith in Jesus, then we become vulnerable. We feel like we are lacking something, and we stumble that way. When we were young, there were many people who would starve, who found it difficult to even eat three meals a day. And when people went to the military, they were always so hungry. Nowadays, it's a buffet. What is there for us to complain about? And so just 50 or 60 years ago, we weren't even able to eat. But now there's so much food abundantly within around us. So what is there to complain about? And so people who, who have lost everything, perhaps even if they, people who may ha not have certain body parts, all they would want is for them to be able to at least live a day with normal functioning body parts. May you give thanks for what has been given to you. How is it that you resent God? before God who reigns over our life and death. How can you condemn others when God is watching you? But because people are unhappy with in believing in Jesus and they're not happy or content with that, that is why they bring about those actions. And that's why Satan plays tricks on them and uses them as his own instrument because individuals are not enough with Christ alone. They stumble. All of you believers, may you taste the, the joy of believing in Jesus and may you be filled with that joy. Believing in Jesus should be so happy 
receiving the word should be such a joy and should be healing and you should be anticipating it. And that is why we always say that our belief, our, the members of Yewon Church, our facial expressions are different, that we're so friendly, that we're, we all look so happy because we've received grace. And therefore, may you not be deceived by any of Satan's deceptions, and may you be able to live a walk of faith that has discernment. This is the conclusion. Carl Sandburg, a famous American poet, compared life to the process of peeling an onion. The more you peel an onion, the more it makes your eyes water. Likewise, life also only becomes more painful as we live it. At first glance, this may seem like a true statement. However, a life that has the life of Jesus Christ is the exact opposite. As the more one lives life, the more they live this walk of faith. They taste that it is no longer tears of pain, but that they have tears of gratitude, of thanksgiving, and joy. Satan will try to deceive us continuously. For us to be sad, for us to feel unjust. But do not be deceived by it. Let us follow after me. Let us interpret everything spiritually. You must be able to interpret things spiritually. The more our faith grows, the more life becomes joyful rather than burdensome. And so to be bound and to be to suffer, to be swayed by what others say, to be discouraged and to be completely broken due to incidents, that's not a walk of faith. It means that you have not held on to the word of God firmly. But instead, whenever we discover God's will and purpose in each incident, event, circumstance, and encounter, we cannot help but be grateful for His grace. This is what a biblical walk of faith is. We must give thanks without ceasing. Is it too difficult? Has your leg become broken? If God is alive, then why do you think He's allowed that? Then you must spiritually interpret the situation, be comforted by that, and when you give thanks, miracles take place. God will have to work. The things that are visible in the world, the things that we hear, the things that we say, those are all introductory things. Those are all introductory things. The main body is only the Word of God. It's all just an introduction. And so the husband, their children, all of that are introductory things. There is no reason for you to stick your life on that. Hold on to the word. Hold on to the main part. And because the things of this world, they just, they're just here temporarily and they fade away. It's very temporary. And, you know, it's already been 37 years since I've pioneered this church, and it doesn't even feel that way. But already 37 years have passed. And so life is like a fog, a temporary fog, a, a dew that is here temporarily and will disappear quickly. I bless all believers of Yewon Church in the name of the Lord to open your spiritual eyes so that you may be able to live a life of the main part and not be deceived by the introductory things. May your pain be restored to praise today. Let us pray. Father God, may all Yewon believers, starting today, just as may children become young adults and young adults become fathers, may they all grow spiritually. May we not be comforted by man, but may we be comforted by the Word of God, and may we be able to 
discern both. It's God's will and may we follow and carry out the will of God. May we become people of God and people of the Word who do so. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen.